Dion, welcome to the podcast. It's great to have you. Carrie, thanks so much for having me. I'm excited. Yeah, I'm excited too. I've never done an episode on AI, so I'm going to learn a lot. Hopefully, leaders will learn a lot, and uh, uh, I'm excited. But you also got a really interesting story as a leader, as an entrepreneur, so I'd like to kind of start there. You've had a storied career for somebody who's barely 30 years old. You told Forbes, I'm constantly learning and growing up, and I'm quoting here, I learned math, computers, and physics. Anytime I saw a problem, I tried to solve it through what I knew, even if I didn't know how to solve it. And, and I think you made your first computer game at seven. Is that right? Um, uh, yeah, seven, maybe maybe eight, but it was definitely right around there. Well, I, I, I've got uh, decades on you and I haven't made mine yet. So that's impressive. <laughs> um, Thank you. When you go back and you look at the breadcrumbs, you know, what made you realize you want to be a founder? What what led you to this place where you're working in AI and you are where you are now? Yeah, I, I think um, it really does go back to what, what you were saying earlier in that I've always considered myself to be a, a problem solver, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, I've always followed my curiosity. Anytime I had a question, I would, I would follow it. And even if it was a dumb question, uh, like I remember when I was you know, learning math and starting to get pretty deep in the math, even in like college, um, I, I went back and I thought to myself, I don't really know how division works, like, like how to divide. <laughs> and, 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 and it's funny because you, you learn a lot of these things in school and you kind of like it, it, it's taught to you in kind of a way that's rote or whatever. And I, and I've always just had this, um, this, this curiosity in my mind that if I don't fully understand something like to the point where you could explain it to me like I'm four or I could explain it to a four year old, then I just want to, I want to learn more. And so I think that, um, combined with, um, what the, the concept of problem solving, which is, is kind of the same, you know, a different side to the same coin of like, okay, how do we actually, you know, put the puzzle piece together? How do we figure this out has always been a guiding function for me. Um, and, and that's how I learned to code. Quite frankly, I was interested in my, my brothers and I growing up, um, you know, we didn't have a lot of money, but we, we had, um, uh, a video, we had video game consoles, um, and, you know, we were playing, I think it was Final Fantasy or whatever, but like those RPG games. Um, and I was always like, well, but how, like, how does it work? How do, how do you, how, where do video games come from? <laughs> you know? And, and, and that was a really fun thread that eventually led me to trying to understand how to build them myself and how to code. And, and over the years, every time I found a, a um, passion project or every time I found something that piqued my interest, I would come back to it and I would ask the question and then try to find the answer to that question as a form of problem solving. That almost sounds like a pathway to an engineer, though, doesn't it? <laughs> it is a pathway know. to an engineer. Yeah, no, but that, that uh -huh. is, I actually think, I mean, so prior to starting Forethought, um, I, I did become an engineer. So um, eventually went to school out in University of Waterloo in, in Canada, um, which is near. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and, and so I, I became an engineer and, and it was only a few years after that, that I realized that, um, I transformed that into becoming an entrepreneur. Um, and, and they're kind of different careers to some degree, but they're, uh, pulling on the, the same thread, which is how do you build things that solve problems for real people? Interesting. My son, who's a software engineer, did his first two years at Waterloo as well. And uh, nice. what brought you to Waterloo? I'm I'm Toronto based, just north of Toronto, so oh, I know nice. it well. And Malcolm Gladwell raves about the place. Yeah, that is awesome. Yeah, no. So I was born in Toronto, actually. Um, oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Grew up in 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 North York, um, so over kind of in the Jane and Wilson area, but kind of the. Oh yeah. The, the the ghetto. Osgood grad. Exactly. We're in the same neighborhood. There you <laughs> <Yeah>. go. <laughs> I yeah, didn't know yeah, that. Exactly. Okay. Um, so all all over near there, um, and so yeah, that, that that that's where I grew up. Those were my my quote unquote stomping grounds. Um, yeah. As I got deeper and deeper into coding, uh, in the it was like the seventh grade. Um, I was fortunate enough uh, to kind of be at a school that was pretty academically strong or like all the people around me started to 
um, really be interested in, in in being good at school, which is like a was a weird thing for for me. Um, mm -hmm. But um, I remember there were these math competitions. Um, it was like the Euclid or whatever it was called at the time. Oh, yeah. Um, if you yeah, do you remember that exactly? And I do. And um, that was my first time kind of doing those. And they, they kind of kicked my butt. Like they were super hard and completely um, out of, you know, kind of over my head. Um, and they were they were hosted by the University of Waterloo. They were always sponsored by the University of Waterloo. I don't know if you remember those. And and so I just I never made it past round one. I don't think I ever entered. Uh, just math was not my strong suit. So keep going. Yeah. So I don't remember that. Yeah, I know. I know Waterloo. And, and um, and because I was, you know, already interested in, in programming and, and to get good at building things like, you know, to build collision and gravity and video games, you have to know a little bit of math. And so I was interested in, in the math. And um, but it was so hard. I was like, OK, I'm like decent at this. But when it comes to um, when it when it comes to these math competitions, it was like super difficult. And so naturally, I was like, okay, well, how can I get better at this? <laughs> uh, you know, my 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 theme. How can I learn more? Um, and so I started really diving into those. in In high school, there were similar competitions, but on the computer side, programming competitions, um, so to speak, also hosted by the University of Waterloo. Also similarly kicked my butt, um, and also similarly piqued an interest in like, okay, well, if this is hard, what can I learn? Like, I must be able to learn more from this. Um, and that was like kind of a, a thread in, in, uh, in high school. Um, but then because the university of Waterloo sponsored the whole thing, I had this like notion in my head that like, I want to go to that school one day, um, quite mm. frankly. Um, no one, no one in my, my family had, you know, gone to college. Uh, I mentioned before we, you know, kind of grew up in a, in a low income household, my parents were immigrants from the Caribbean and kind of had nothing when they came to Canada or when they went to Canada. Um, and so I didn't really have a concept of university or college, but I just like knew in the back of my mind that that was the school. That was my dream school. That was where I wanted to go. Um, and so like I did whatever I could from in terms of grades and continuing to learn about computing and all that stuff, which I was, you know, on the computer side, naturally interested in, but really, really wanted to go there. And so I ended up um, being really fortunate to to attend University of Waterloo, and um, it was actually an experience that I think was even even better than I was expecting um, to some degree. Yeah, it's a it's a very prestigious school, um, especially for engineering and computer engineering in particular. Um, so you switch gears to an entrepreneur. What made you? Where did the entrepreneurial gene come from? Yeah, um, great question. So I. I never knew that I was going to be an entrepreneur. It wasn't even a thing that like I knew was possible or quote unquote allowed, right? Like I wasn't, mm. I wasn't like, Hey, you know, I'm going to go and start a business one day just from my family's background and where, where I came from. It wasn't a thing, so to speak, but I had always been building things. And in hindsight, now, when I look back, I like, that's kind of the entrepreneurial, um, pursuit in and of itself. Um, you know, learning how to make video games um, in in high school when I was um, again starting to get into math and computers. I was super bad at history, actually, um, as a as just a class. Like I couldn't memorize any of the dates or the facts and things like that. Um, and so it was really hard for me. And and I had this idea of what if I could build you know technology to help me study, right? Like there's all these notes, there's textbooks, there's already all this information. What if I could use technology to, you know, basically accelerate cue cards, right? Instead of having to quiz myself or things like that. And and so over over the years, like every once in a while, I would come back to an idea or a problem that I was either trying to solve for myself or a curiosity or or a story I wanted to tell, whether in the video game world. And and then I would, as as we talked about, use code or or use whatever I knew in order to kind of try and bring that to life. Um, and, and so it was, it, that was just a repeated kind of pattern and it was fun for me as well. Like I would, you know, eventually stop playing video games with my brothers and be like, Hey guys, I'm just like working on this, like coding stuff. And I'd be like, okay, fine. But like, you know, come hang out and play Halo with us later. <laughs> yeah. and so that, that became what I, what I did. And so, you know, years later, um, when I eventually started, uh, my company forethought, um, it was really in so many ways, like you said, looking back on the breadcrumbs, it was a culmination of that, right? Because 
for example, that textbook reader study idea was why I actually got into AI in the first place, which is trying to understand how can technology understand text, understand human language the same way humans do, right? And, and, you know, back then it wasn't even like a possible thing. It was very early stages of what we now call AI and natural language understanding and so on. Um, but I was like, okay, but like somehow we have to be able to build this. Um, and so I think the technology in and of itself started getting really powerful over the last decade or so. Um, yeah. But it was definitely something that that stuck with me. And so eventually I, I started a company in AI, um, I guess, surprisingly or unsurprisingly, when you when you put all those pieces together. So let's go there. I mean, you you went through Facebook, you went through Dropbox and other places before you started Forethought. But what is what is Forethought? What do you do? Thank you. Yeah. So um, at Forethought, we use human centered AI to transform the customer service experience. Um, so in a nutshell, when you think about think about the last time you were put on hold, right? Maybe you bought an amazing product, but it didn't work as planned. So you had to call a support team or you were at work and you had to, you had a benefits question. And so you had to shoot off an email to HR um, or you had an urgent healthcare question about a loved one, right? And, and you had to um, call your primary care physician or something like that. In, in all of these cases, you have a question that you need answered. Um, but you're greeted by being put on hold or, or by an agent who doesn't have the full context. And so the idea behind Forethought is, what if there were there was AI embedded into this, this interaction, into the system, um, AI that had all of your conversation history with support, all of support's conversation history, had learned um, how agents have answered certain questions, had learned how um, con consumers had asked those questions, and then could provide efficiencies on top of that. So automatically resolving issues. I, I think we've all interacted with kind of legacy chatbots before. So imagine that, but maybe way smarter. Um, or helping get these issues into the hands of the most knowledgeable agent and then empowering that agent to be um, more efficient, uh, more intelligent with respect to your specific case and all of the insights and analytics on top. So that's kind of how we think about ourselves on the whole. Um, and uh, our long-term kind of mission and, and vision really is to bring this first to customer service, but also to, I think, every single kind of human-centered workflow um, could benefit from AI in this way. Okay, well, I want to break that down and then I want to pull the camera back a little bit and talk about okay. AI, which I think most of us barely understand. Okay, um, so let's say I'm calling a company, a 1-800 number, uh, powered by Forethought. How is it different? Do I get like Siri on the other line? Do I get Alexa? Like what, 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 it, how is that yeah. different from your call is important to us, you know, which it's not because <laughs> I have to wait later. 20 minutes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, how do, how do, how do we get beyond just the looped tape that plays in the background? What's different? Absolutely. So um, we'll start, let's, let's talk specifically about like email and chat digital channels because they're Sure. easier problems to solve. Um, and yeah. and um, a lot of our customers are using those di digital channels. But yeah, if you were sure. to, you know, send an email to Instacart or somebody today supported instacart.com and, and hey, I have an issue, my order wasn't delivered and so on. In the old world, um, you'd be greeted or you'd get this little email back saying, hey, thanks, your issue is important to us. We'll get back to you as you kind of described. Um, and then you'd wait maybe 30 minutes or so, or an hour, or whatever, sometimes days. Or a day. And, <laughs> or uh, this day. is, this is my, this is my week <laughs> this week. I ordered some clothes. Yeah. It's like, I get the notice your package has been delivered. I'm like, there's no package. There's no package. So I go to <laughs> the website. I find their customer service number. I send them an email, or email, send them an email. I get the, Hey, you know what? We, we acknowledge receipt. We'll get back to you in a day or two. Volumes a day are later, a bit higher than expected. The, volumes are always yeah. higher than normal. They're never, yeah. they're never normal. Never anymore. normal, of course. No. That so then I get an email back saying, "Well, sometimes it's marked as delivered, but it didn't really happen." You know what happened just before we interviewed? We did this interview. It got delivered. It, so it worked, but it was like a two-day process, literally. Exactly. I mean, and I think there were actual humans typing it out once the autoresponder went out. So let's talk about that because that's something all of us can relate to. Perfect use case, too. right? And so yeah. in, in your experience, it took many days, probably a bunch of wrong answers um, and a lot of frustration. 
with, yeah. say, Forethought in the background, well, one, you send in that email. The first thing that happens is um, our AI is is reading the email and saying, okay, what is going on here? What is Carrie's problem, right? What's, what's the issue that Carrie has? Um, a few things can happen, right? So most likely for this kind of um, issue, our AI will literally be integrated with the the order tracking system or the refund system or whatever um, down the stack. So one step one, it will understand. Okay, you're having an issue. Your order wasn't delivered. There's some you know AI wizardry, I guess, to to even figure out what is your problem based on the text and the language you sent in your email. Because again, computers aren't human. For us, it's obvious. But like, okay, first you got to do that. Then step two, it's like, okay, did you put your order number in the email or not? And you've probably typed it in free form. So, right. And so then it will figure out, hey, okay, of all the text that you just said, this is your order number. You said my order number is blank or whatever. It's using natural language understanding to say, okay, this is the order number. Then it will go and check, okay, order number, blah, 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 get back the response from the system. And all of this is happening in seconds, by the way. So you simply get an email instead of saying, hey, we'll get back to you in 24 hours. You get an email saying, hi, this is Forethought or Agatha or whoever on behalf of um, the, your, the business. Company. Yeah, exactly. And, um, and it will say, hey, um, thanks for your email. Sounds like you're having a problem with your order. Um, look, um, I've tracked that your order number is this. Um, looked into the system. Here is where we see your order. It says maybe delivered in this system, but, uh, you know, we found that there's an error, blah, blah, blah here, common issue. Um, all of that writes out that response and sends it to you. And you get that back within two minutes, right? And so you at least get that, all of that instant response time, as well as something that's a little bit more intelligent than just your, your kind of rote response. Oh, that's fascinating. Okay. So now I want to break it down. Back to your question. What is long division? Like, what is AI? So yes. what is what yes. is happening on the servers? And like, what is going on to generate that? Because that's something I don't understand. So those are my favorite kinds of questions. Like, what is long division? Why did we learn this weird algorithm in, in, <laughs> in, in you know, grade school that says you have to carry the... Like, what does it even mean? And why does it work? Um, so here we are. Let's... What is AI like we're for? And, yeah. and I think it's a great question. So... um high level goals I'll talk about and then and then we can talk about the mechanics of how it works today um, so high level goals AI or artificial intelligence is really any technology um, that is to that is built to mimic either how a human um, behaves so you can think of classical chatbots as mimicking like speech and stuff like that or the um, mimics how humans think and make decisions. Um, and often those are two very different things. So example is, um, even Google ads today, right? Ad optimization, things like that. That's actually using AI under the surface to try and make decisions about what you might like as a consumer, um, and whether to serve you this ad or not, or whatever, um, using kind of decisions that, that a human would otherwise be making, but it doesn't mimic how a human speaks or behaves or whatever, it mimics the decision-making process. So we almost don't even realize that there's AI going on under the hood there. And so it's important to kind of take those two things. Um, and that's generally, like, it's a broad, broad term. Anything that tries to mimic how a human behaves or how a human thinks is considered AI. And there's been many generations of AI, so to speak, over the past, call it 50 years, um, maybe even longer, right? So in, in the early days, it was a lot of um, rules-based logic, right? Okay, if person says, um, I guess in the case of customer service, refund, go and issue refund, and and so on and so forth. And so it's almost pre-programmed in the pre-programmed, early days, yeah, right. And when you see refund, do this exactly. And and nowadays we almost don't even consider that AI. We can I, I like to say I consider that more artificial than intelligent. But again, it's mm. trying to mimic. I, I think in that case, not even how a human thinks, but how a human behaves, right? Oh, hey, you got a response back that said, I think you want a refund or whatever. But it was literally just looking at the word refund. If you had said, you guys suck, I just want my money back. It would have no idea how to respond, right? right, right, right. Um, but yeah, and so there, there are generations of it. The the current incarnation or the current like um, iteration of artificial intelligence is, is called machine learning or deep learning. Um, and that's 
probably what you know 80% of AI is in in today's day and age. I think I still think there's there's more beyond this, and you know it's not necessarily the, the the best thing, but here's where we are. And machine learning and deep learning work by um, basically training in, in air quotes um, the system to pick up patterns from history, right? And so because we have a proliferation of data today, right? Again, like Google Ads, Google probably processes billions of queries a day, an hour. I don't, I don't really know. But we have all this click-through data on you, on, on whatever. And so there's all this data on your history that could be used to make predictions about how you might behave in the future. Um, other examples like... Um, you know, being able to predict or, or uh, rank how, whether somebody is likely to default on a loan or whether they should be eligible for this mortgage. And so all of these systems are using past data and basically statistics, quite frankly, like the probability that you do X or probability that you do Y and, and pretty fancy algorithms to, to then build a model or a computer program that can, can then make those decisions. So you're no longer pre-programming or hard coding anything, you're saying, hey, we want you to mimic roughly the decision making that's been going on in this process, right? Um, you know, when you see a, um, an email labeled as spam versus not spam, like this is how it's been labeled in the past. Now let's get a machine to learn how to do that, right? And so um, that's been the, the most common iteration of machine learning to date. Um, and, and one more, just to throw another term in there, um, there's this now concept called deep learning, which is even Mm -hmm. cooler a variant of machine learning which is again um just a a type of ai using statistics deep learning uses these these um tools called artificial neural networks so the program that you're building or the program that you're training so to speak it, it it's it's actually just um it's really a big graph of of numbers of you know matrices and, and vectors or whatever but it, it's meant to mimic neurons in the human brain right and so each individual unit is kind of a mini program in and of itself and then given the training or given the tuning it's learning to um, produce signals or, or numbers at the end of the day to to other units of the of the network turns out weirdly enough if you build a big enough artificial neural network, uh, a deep enough artificial neural network um, and given enough data, it can actually learn common mathematical functions like addition, subtraction, whatever. It can learn or be tuned to actually produce those outputs given the inputs. And it also turns out it can be used to produce really complicated mathematical functions like will Carrie click this article or not, right? And so they actually, it's, it's kind of, it's pretty wild. Um, and there's a lot of theory about it. But yeah, so that's that's like when I say training the model, that's usually what kind of model people are, are training, quote unquote. And I'm using these terms kind of loosely. So again, AI kindergarten here. Um, and then we'll move up to first year undergrad at some point in this conversation. But in, in the simple cases of AI, that could be a simple computer, like a software that just does this. But if you're talking about deep learning, you have then got a neural network, like you've got multiple computers, multiple processors, multiple machines working at the same time. Because what I'm thinking about, I, I have done some research on this, like, you know, when you really research how certain trees operate, they're a network. You think a tree actually is alone. But if you look at, uh, I think it's Aspen, right? Like underneath, yeah. there's a network and they're all, and, and, um, uh, even sequoias apparently do not have a very deep root system, but they're all intertwined. And that's why you can have a 300-foot exactly. tree and it doesn't get toppled in a strong wind because they're all interconnected. And, you know, there's research about whether trees actually talk to each other, communicate with each other, etc. at some conscious level, sentient level. Um, something like that is happening with AI as well. Exactly. Like uh, quite okay. literally, but in a, in a mathematical form, right? It's, it's a simpler unit. Sure. Um, one, one clarification I will add, though, is that yeah, for, for even moderately um, deep neural networks, you can do that all in one computer. And so it's literally oh, cool. just different um, cells or memory, you know what I mean? Like different variables, yeah, yeah. so to speak. Yeah. Um, but then, yeah, as it gets pretty, pretty large, you might have to do it across multiple computers. And that's where you get into what they call distributed computing, um, which is literally that. How do you you know, run these programs on 
larger and larger machines. So like somebody, you know, the big tech giants will probably be, have like thousands of these machines running these, these programs or, or so on and so forth. Um, but yeah. Okay. What is the difference between, and I'm, I'm going to throw a bunch of um, acronyms at you, AI, AGI, ASI and ANI. So artificial narrow intelligence, artificial super intelligence, artificial general intelligence, and just artificial intelligence. Those are some terms that are commonly banded about. Um, feel free to pick two or three to focus on. Maybe some are tangential. Um, I assume narrow intelligence is, we've already touched on that a little bit. It just does very limited function. Uh, but what about AGI, ASI, and AI? Yeah, no, absolutely. This is this is awesome. So um, the way I like to think about it is um, AI is a broad term and it can mean a thousand different things, um, including like the, the uh, click-through ad-serving example um, that we talked about earlier. So the computer in that case knows it's me, knows I'm interested in church leadership, knows I'm interested in leadership as a whole, knows I love to barbecue, knows what I buy, and it serves me up a, hey, you need these sneakers or have you ever seen... Yeah. Have you ever seen this barbecue stand or whatever that is? Absolutely. Right? So it, it kind of knows me and you it's serving up video games or whatever. <laughs> exactly. Okay, <got> it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, where's, where's the next generation of Pokemon. Right. Um, uh-huh. And so that is how I, how I think about the, the term AI and it can mean many different things. Yeah. AGI is, uh, well, I guess the, the problem with AI is that sometimes it can be boring. Right. Like the, the idea that the thing serving your ad is actually AI is almost unsatisfying to <laughs> to the imagination. Right. What what AGI captures um, almost the sci fi definition of AI. Right. Like yeah. the, this is what sing- everyone's scared of. Singularity. It's whatever, right. <laughs> yeah, oh, the robots exactly. are taking over. The robots. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, and C3PO from Star Wars or whatever, like an, an AI that. It can roughly interact the same way a human can in, in most daily situations. It could be limited in, in some fashions, maybe by form or function or whatever. But like most people looking at that would be like, oh, that's intelligent. Like that's that's like doing things that a person would, you know? So just at the lay level, I think a lot, and we'll link to one of the videos, but is it Boston Robotics or what's the company that Boston produces Dynamics, those dogs, yeah, Boston yeah, yeah. Dynamics. Yeah, that that freaks everybody out about once every two years or so. They <laughs> like, release right, a new video and it's like, robot. oh my gosh, look at these dogs. Like, is that AGI or AI or what? what is that? Yeah, um, th- so it's starting to blur the lines, right? And I think it yeah. kind of depends on how you think about it. But it, it does look remarkable, like how those dogs walk, the Boston Dynamics. It looks exactly like how a real dog would walk down to like how they stabilize themselves and you know how the the bounce and and i think that's not just pre-programmed that's because it it ended up discovering the optimal way to walk which ends up looking a lot like how we figured out how to do it and so that's when you start to get into like okay this looks like true artificial general intelligence um the only problem with those is that i think they don't make decisions or communicate um and for better or for worse, we as humans think about speech and communication and language as part of the the concept of AGI. Um, I think you could get AGI without it, right? Like you could imagine if something were the IQ of a fruit fly or something even, right? Like, you know, it's flying around, it's making choices, whatever. You'd probably feel like, wow, that's, that's, that's pretty intelligent, like, you know, relative to, to a basic computer, I guess, to, to some degree. So I, I don't know. I think there's there's lines that are that are blurred for sure. Um, but yeah, in general, as things start to look and feel like our, our day-to-day concept of intelligence, like, okay, this dog, maybe Boston Dynamics, is now starting to bark and communicate and and whatever. And it's like, hey, I, I need to be recharged or whatever. Like, Or go find its owner or something like or that. Or go find its right? owner and like just know to do that without anyone having pre-programmed that because a lot of it, a lot of it you can pre-program then you're like, okay, this is, this is starting to get into AGI. And so I think that's, that's, um, it's a fuzzy line, but that's really the definition of AGI. And then contrasting that to ANI, narrow intelligence, most, most, um, AI tasks today are kind of human level. Like they can perform as good as a human, 
but only on the specific task. Like you can you can build a model or build one of these deep neural networks or whatever to I don't know generate um, Shakespeare <laughs> actually nowadays like you, to generate text and it gets really really good at generating Shakespeare or there's like um, Dolly which is an open AI model can literally paint you give it a prompt of I want you know a picture picture of a dog riding a bicycle on a, on the moon in the style of Van Gogh and you type that in and then it'll just produce a painting. Uh, is that available broadly or do you have to have access to that, Molly? I've heard different podcasters say that they've tried it. Yeah, I think you can apply to get access. I don't even, I don't have access, but I think there's versions of it online that you can literally just play around with. Um, so I would, like simpler versions, maybe they're not as powerful, but like, so that becomes, okay, it's really powerful and starting to border on AGI in theory, but again, it's on a narrow task. So is it or is it not? Well, it's it's at least artificial narrow. It's it's pretty narrow, but it's powerful, right? And so this specific task, it achieves human level kind of accuracy. And ASI would be the high end of AGI, right? Exactly. Artificial yeah. super intelligence is the high end. So yeah, beyond what, human intelligence, yeah. One of the debates, and this is in sci-fi, it's, in, it's actually becoming a somewhat live issue in our lifetime, but... Um, I've heard it described as singularity. So singularity, to my mind, and again, I want your definition, I could be wrong, is that point at which the superintelligence of a computer, a computer network, eclipses that of a human being. Cue, you know, the Frankenstein narrative, like, oh my goodness, the machine is taking over and, you know, is out to kill me, or the robots are taking over, or you have robot armies or that kind of thing. And singularity, I guess, goes back to that point of creation at the beginning of the origin of the universe, right? When there was nothing and then there was something is what scientists will call singularity. Uh, is that is that a approximate understanding of singularity? How would you define it? I, I could be totally wrong again. I'm just an no, amateur yeah, yeah, yeah. I learning think these that's, things. That's right. I, I would, just for disclaimer purposes, I am not the expert on this, um, but I do have a lot of opinions that I'm happy to share. Oh, great. Um, share them. Yeah. Yeah. But um, no, I, I think that's right, right? Like the concept um, or the reason that the word singularity is used is because it's it's that point of no return, right? Like once it's, it's mm. beyond this, you can't unravel it, right? Because quite literally, if you have an AI that is more intelligent than humans, you have AI that is self- um, has a concept of self and self-preservation, then you literally at that point, like you've, you've created something that will then self uh, propagate or whatever. Perpetuate. I don't know what, yeah. what you want to call yeah, it. Yeah. And so that is, that is a singularity in and of itself. Mm. Um, I, I actually, I don't, I'm, 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 I'm an optimist when I, when it comes to these things. So I'm probably not the person to, uh, to like, there should be people working on the pessimistic view of like, how do you make safe a, AI and, and, and things like that, and how do you prevent a singularity or whatever? Um, but but I actually like to think about analogies, right? Like I think if you had an AI that was approximately as smart as humans, you would have that the same way you'd have another human, or the same way you'd have um, an animal like a dolphin, which is you know pretty smart, right? We don't get scared that there are dolphins, <laughs> right? Or right. even that there there are other humans, right? Because um, for the most part, I mean, you know, people, people can suck sometimes, but like mm. people are people. Right. And, and so I also think about it like that. It, it's, it's almost not as exciting, but almost a more sober view, so to speak of AI in that if you had something that was about as intelligent as a human, that would be the equivalent of having another human. It'd have more capabilities because it could connect to the internet and this sort of thing. But like, for example, and I was thinking about this the other day, it still took Einstein, who you'd argue is a pretty, you know, superhuman uh, in terms of IQ, a very long time to even figure out, you know, relativity or, or you know, quantum physics or whatever. And so if you had something roughly the IQ of a human, it would still take a reasonably long time to solve some of the hardest problems, like how to, you know, break cryptography or whatever, like whatever those, those NP hard problems are, so to speak, but the equivalent of that, um, maybe AI hard problems. And so it would be a useful tool because then we could probably accelerate it. Like it might take, you know, an Einstein plus an AI less than the 10 or 15 years it took him. Maybe it would take like three years or whatever, right? It'd be useful to advance human knowledge. We'd be able to figure out 
um, you know, proteins and to, to cure cancers and stuff like that over mm-hmm. time. But these things, I think the fear is like, oh, this is going to happen overnight. And then suddenly the AI is going to like take over the world and destroy everything. Right. Like, I don't think that works that way. If you thought about having another person who's as smart or smarter than you in the room and, and could access the internet, right? Like that's kind of what mm-hmm. we're saying about real AGI. Um, in in kind of the short time frame, I think eventually we do have to figure out what happens in terms of a singularity. But you probably like I think we're even way far out from that. Yeah. So there's a couple of active debates. One is the timeline about singularity. Some people say it's within the next decade. Other people, like you just hinted, like ah, we don't even know, but it's way far out. Um, and then the whole well, let's stop there, and then I'll ask about malevolent versus benevolent which is a a raging debate in AI circles. So, you know, to that point where you would have an equal, and I understand that, you know, okay, once the the AI has the ability to self-perpetuate, to think independently, and we kind of, quote, lose control, you know, that could spiral quickly. But how far is that possible singularity and I realize a lot of this is speculation, but how much, like, is that going to happen in the next decade? Perhaps our lifetime, another century? Do we know? Uh, and and uh, one yeah. more caveat. I was listening to a podcast from an AI expert recently, and I think he said right now, the uh, all the combined, like the fastest AI or the best AI sort of is the equivalent to the mind of a honeybee. And I'm like, really? Is that it? Is that accurate? I think so. And I've heard that phrase before, um, or that, that tone, like a honeybee or a worm or something in that actually honeybees are pretty smart. So probably right around there. And that's, Mm. that's like for what it's worth from like a human achievement perspective, huge, right? Like that is, that is really, um, powerful, but yeah, we're, we're kind of far off. Although it's hard to predict these things because most advancements happen in this weird stepwise fashion, right? Like in the sense of it doesn't happen in a continuous um, way. It it happens, you know, it's a bunch of people putting energy in and 99% of it doesn't work out. And there's a chance that that last 1% didn't as well. And then we've ended up nowhere, but maybe it did work out by some luck of the draw. And then, oh, suddenly, cool. Now we have AlphaGo, you know, or like a a chess champion AI. And and then now we have, and, and so on. And so, I do think it's it's non-linear in that sense, uh, non-continuous. And the other thing is that even though we have all these models of the universe of you know uh, probabilistic, like you can model economics or you can model how a a um, um, how a field is going to develop, it also happens by people, right? And mm-hmm. so you know, um, say say what you want about Elon Musk or whatever, whether you like him or hate him, but like. Electric cars, for example, they were kind of a yeah. thing. And then, you know, it, it took a reasonably wealthy billionaire person to go and make electric cars cool. And then all of a sudden, okay, that, that was like a nice little leap forward. And then all the other companies are following suit because they have to and and so on, whether you want to attribute it to that or not. Like that happens because you happen to have people and and so on kind of just deciding to do that. And, and, and that doesn't happen every day, right? And so it's, it's kind of a weird thing. Um, in that things are always kind of evolving, but they're sometimes not. Um, so anyway, to answer your question, I do think though that in the last even decade, um, there have been so many powerful, at least like narrow intelligence, um, AI that have come out like Dolly that we talked about that can paint mm. like Shakespeare or paint like, um, Salvador Dali. Right, like Shakespeare, or <laughs> right? Like, like Shakespeare. Salvador Dali. Yeah, yeah. Right. Like there, there are enough of these coming out that are starting to like, be like, oh, like at least on this task, like you're doing as well as a human can for the most part. I mean, you can look at it like for the Shakespeare stuff, you can kind of tell it's it's actually still garbled garbage, but like sounds, it sounds like a, you know, like a high school kid plagiarized something, but like got very close um, that I, I think we are probably in the, you know, next five decades, probably 50 years, like we're going to have something that's, I wouldn't call singularity, but something, some sets of things that are more than just artificial narrow AI, but still mm. feel kind of general. Um, but again, I think also at the same time, you have all of these researchers studying safe AI, right? Um, you have all these researchers 
thinking about how do you make sure that this is um, done in a responsible way. And I think the two kind of fields probably progress around the same amount. And and so even if you had an AI, if it's like restricted to a computer, then like it's not really that dangerous or hard on it. Right. Like, you know what I mean? And so um, robotics would have to get good or, or nanotechnology or whatever before, like, it starts to become a, a nuisance. Um, so anyway, more more to more to think about there. But uh, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, no, that really does with timing. And again, there's a real variety of opinion out there. But I'm also interested in your benevolent view of A.I., because I think Elon Musk is on record as being deeply concerned about the <laughs> yeah, negative exactly. potentials of AI. Others that I've listened to or read have a much more um, benevolent view. Yeah, I think it was yeah. in Henry Kissinger and Eric Schmidt's book. There was a third author on that, on AI that came out last year. You know, they were talking about kind of what you were hinting at, the pharmacological benefits of that. Like basically drug research is trial and error. And you work exactly. for six months or a year on a problem. And then one day you discover, um, no, wrong, wrong field. We're going to move to another research area. And you start researching this, a year goes by, no, dead end there. And you start again. Whereas AI could speed that up significantly. On the other hand, chemical warfare, um, you know, somebody misprograms your Tesla to wound and kill, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Very bad spot. Yeah. Yeah, like we we discovered nuclear uh, capability and then and then had the atomic bomb, right? That so, that was actually the the analogy I was going to give. Um, yeah, there's always this like with great power comes great responsibility, Uncle Ben mm-hmm. thing going on. Um, I think nuclear is probably the best example of it, right? And there's probably maybe a, a single digit handful number of technologies of, in the past in human history that that are um, equivalent in power and potential but also equivalent in potential to damage, right? Um, and I don't have a good answer. I think at the end of the day, people are people, uh, right? And like th- with nuclear, we do have probably today the ability to perpetually power the energy of all humans on Earth. Um, you know, that plus or minus solar, like there's a few other things. Um, but we also have this, you know, dangerous ability to literally wipe out all humans on Earth, right? Like, you know, no, 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 um, no way to sugarcoat that. And so um, somehow we have survived so far. <laughs> it's like, this is like the morbid view. I don't know if that's a, um, a good way to put it. But my point is it will, in the end, it will boil down to all of this, like the research, people putting in ethical practices, government, policy, all of that. Um, and... And I'm I'm optimistic that I think people will like as these things develop start to develop the the processes. I am not under delusion that it couldn't be dangerous. I would say is probably how I would describe it. Yeah, but that is a really interesting case study. I mean, it's been almost eighty years since the atomic bomb was deployed. Um, it's killed a lot of people, but we haven't blown the entire planet up. And I know there's a school of thought that says, well, we're destroying the planet anyway through we're, climate change, <laughs> yeah, et cetera, exactly. et cetera. Cars. Carbon. But there cars, you go. yeah, carbon. Yeah. I mean, you know, but it is a really interesting dance. As tense as the world is, at times, we have managed to restrain from blowing each other to smithereens, which is a really interesting study in human nature and perhaps providence and the grace of God or uh, that kind of thing. Um, is there anything inherent in AI or AGI, that would say the rules that have governed us for the last 80 years, which is tense sometimes, whether you're talking about North Korea's threats or China or Russia or America or whatever, um, you know, there's been a lot of saber rattling, but is there anything inherent in AI that would make that different? Like, for example, chemical warfare, right? If you're programming machines to make advances, you theoretically could really, or, or is there something in the, nature to AI that would make human beings treat it differently? I think that's probably the heart of my that's question. The, that is the question. Um, yeah. I'm trying to think, because usually, or the way I like to problem solve through these kinds of questions is is to try and pull pieces of different analogies, right? The, like it's not, you know, a brand new technology, even if though it is, there's probably elements of it that can be pulled in. So how have we treated, so nuclear, as we talked about, um, 
arms race. <laughs> so, uh, so what will probably happen then is every government goes and tries to figure out how they can go build their own form of AGI. Let's, I mean, let's assume that's already happening right now. Um, sure. Then I think the, the like, like security, cybersecurity may be actually maybe the best analogy. Like this is, you know, there's a lot of wars being fought on the cybersecurity front even today. Right, um, you know, with stuff going on in Russia and Ukraine and stuff like that. So, um, what we saw with that, even just taking cybersecurity and social media as an example, you know, potentially destabilizing elections or, or whatever, those are all um, areas. So, I do think with AI or you know potential AGI, there's there's going to be a lot of that, but I think it's going to end up being a similar like, okay, you develop the technologies as you develop the policies and um, kind of defense mechanisms, so to speak. Um, and you, you get to a state of stable equilibrium, unfortunately, uh, or fortunately actually is probably the better way of putting it, um, where like it it ends up becoming stalemate. Like I think any one of these technologies, cybersecurity, social media, nuclear, probably nuclear is the most, most powerful there because of just like the physical energy capacity there. Um, but I think you've seen them develop in similar ways, right? People start to learn and figure it out, use it for their own good, um, and then start to figure out countermeasures. So that's the best I can think of. I don't I don't know if there's anything necessarily new. And we'd like to think so because, you know, we we think of the C3PO's of the world. But if you had if, you know, country A had a C3PO and country B had a C3PO, it, you know, it just makes a better ally in in kind of thinking and strategy and whatever. But I think I don't think it would fundamentally change the rules of engagement. Mm. Well, you know, nuclear is a really good study in in good and evil because a lot of people who are concerned about climate change would say nuclear perhaps is the solution. Nuclear energy is clean. Exactly. If it's managed well, it can do the entire planet. We can reduce our carbon footprint. And what I didn't know, Todd Wilson, who uh, has been on this podcast a couple of times, he was in the nuclear Navy, uh, trained under Admiral Rickover. I think that's his name. Uh, famous famous uh, leader. And for decades, seven, eight decades, the American Navy has been powered by nuclear power. Never been an incident. Strict protocols. That's how a submarine can go from Japan to uh, you know California yeah. without having to refuel. That's why they can stay underwater that long. Never been an incident because they have safety protocols. So it is, a, it's a, you know, it's we'll just from, let people noodle yeah. on that. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So again, we've got phone systems we're working on. We've got a long way from phone systems right now, but uh, in our conversation, um, people would see, where do people see AI today in their general lives? Where are they seeing it today? Um, yeah, absolutely. So in today's um, society, a lot of recommender systems, right? So anything that's mm-hmm. learning preference. So Netflix, you know, they had done this big AI challenge probably years ago, right? To, to, they paid, I think, a million dollars or something to, you know, the best team that could figure out um, AI for recommenders. Um, self-driving cars are starting to become a big thing. Um, and that's an interesting case study in and of itself because I think that was born out of computer vision, which was a, a branch, a narrow mm-hmm. branch of AI. Like how did, it started with literally researchers figuring out how to detect like whether the scribble was an A or a B or a C, like just from a picture, or is this a cat or a dog? You know, now facial recognition in in social media or in your phone that helps you unlock your phone. Um, all of that stuff is starting to propagate. So it's it's literally everywhere. But again, it's AI, right? Not AGI mm-hmm. in our lives, right? And it's you gotta remember behaves like human or thinks like human. And a lot of this stuff are just making decisions using kind of human concepts under the hood without you realizing it, but it it is pretty ubiquitous everywhere. So self-driving cars are a really good example of, of the question I want to ask next, because, you know, in programming at Tesla and there are levels of AI in cars that are much more than any government permits. Like there are totally self-driving cars. You don't have to touch a thing. Right. And, but in the programming of them, in the engineering of them, engineers had to make moral decisions, you know? So in uh, some of the research I've done, they've talked about, um, you know, (laughs) what if your Tesla came with an ego mode or an altruist mode, right? So the ego mode is the computer has to decide, are we going to save 
your family and kill the little old lady crossing the street or the toddler who ran out to get his ball? Or is it the altruist mode where you sacrifice yourself, but the kid or the little old lady gets saved? Like those are those are real world questions that are now coming up. And as a driver, you kind of make that decision in the instant. But imagine you had to program your car that way. Well, the people programming your cars have to make that decision. And that's philosophical. It's theological. It's spiritual. It's moral. It's ethical. What are some of the ethical, spiritual, theological, philosophical implications of AI moving forward? Ooh, very, <laughs> very deep, <laughs> I will yeah, say. Yeah, they are. Um, well, it's, yeah, it's interesting because, you know, you have in, in the real world today for decisions like these, you have kind of human judgment, you have human bias, and you, for better or for worse, there's a single person making a decision at any point in time. Um, whereas with AI, you almost have policy decisions, right? You almost have these decisions like, hey, I'm, I'm an engineer sitting at, you know, in Tesla and deciding, am I putting in ego mode or altruist mode or you decide? Um, it's, it's kind of a catch 22. I mean, this may be a cop out answer, but, but it, it kind of is because I think, you know, like any ethical question, it really depends on your axioms, right? It really depends on what you take as your, as the source of truth, right? Um, and right. If, if, you know, taking a life under any circumstance is considered bad by your government or whatever, right. Or, your belief system, then you're going to have that as, as your, um, source of truth. And and it's tough because are, am I the one deciding, right? Like I, the programmer or whatever is the company deciding, is it the government or the, you know, religious institution or the somebody else deciding it's really, it's a, it's a tough question. And like, I think like outside of AI, we don't even know how to answer that question today. Right. Like there are a lot of things, for example, um, even going on in the world today where you're like, Hey, okay, X, Y, and Z is happening. Um, but say the, the, you know, in the United States, the U S constitution says a, B and C. And so like, are we supposed to be making the decision on what is right or not? You know, at least as from a country governing body or does the constitution say that? Right. And so, and that's like a completely hard moral question to answer. Um, and so I think with, with AGI or with AI in general, it's going to continue to be challenging, but again, I think it's, it's probably not more challenging than having a, an additional human pop up, right? Like, you know what I mean? Like as you now AGI, if it were about equally as intelligent as humans, but you could kind of program, you could kind of morally push. It's maybe the equivalent of how, do, how are you allowed to raise your kids, right? Like what is <laughs> what is morally right when you raise your kids if you could, you know. AGI more, on parenting? AGI that would be very on helpful. parenting <laughs> or parenting of AGI, right? Like, you know what I mean? Uh-huh. So, um, th- th- yeah, a lot of considerations there. What gets me, Dion, is... You know, I think intuitively, like imagine going down the road, you're surprised somebody runs out. I think in in the split second you have to make a decision, we all go to ego mode. Nobody goes like, if my wife and kids are in the car, I'm trying to save my wife and kids. Right. Right. But I think when you make that decision in advance, ahead of time, it creates a debate. It creates a debate because you're not in that moment. You're like, but then do I say to my wife, well, your car is programmed for ego mode. Mine is for altruist mode. <laughs> and then your wife and kids never want to, or spouse and kids, whatever, never never want to travel with you in your car. Like it's a, it's a really, and I don't know how I'd answer it. I, I don't have to answer it. I don't know how I'd answer it. It's a really great question. So when you're thinking through the ethical implications, even of what you're doing at Forethought, um, what resources are helpful for you because I think we're all facing moral decisions. I mean, you know, as somebody who sells courses and runs the Art of Leadership Academy and does a podcast, I have ethical decisions. Like I've said no to certain brands that want to advertise on the podcast because I don't support what they do. And you leave money on the table, you walk away. But I think on AI, you've you got to think about that at scale. Um, Absolutely. So how do you make those decisions? Um, so again, drawing from... I'll- give the direct answer, but I will just note that what came to mind was around, um, 
this is probably why, you know, Mark Zuckerberg is such a hated guy. Right? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, imagine, yeah. Yeah. I think we have a similar analogy. If you could control information, social media, what people think or what people basically get access to, and you have to make these decisions ahead of time, are you going to allow any policy or any um, perspective on your platform? Or are you going to police certain perspectives? Like, you're, you're, you're never going to it's a hard job. Uh, so I will say that. Um, so bringing that back to this, this, um, particular, um, question for me, I do think genuinely it, it boils down to your values. Um, and, and I mean that in a very literal sense, right? So going back to like the concept of your constitution, what is, in, is it immutable, um, in, 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 in your business? And that may be different for everyone. It may be different for different businesses. Um, you know, like, I was just looking at the WeWork example before, and I'm sure what was immutable there was very different than <laughs> in many other businesses um, in terms of ethics and, and morals. But um, but you you kind of got to decide that for yourself, and we we do that here. We have our um, our values. We call them the genius values: growth mindset, mm-hmm. intelligent empathy, um, being being an owner, um, acting with integrity, being unstoppable, and putting customers first. And um, and we try to like. We try to institutionalize those or, or be, uh, what's the word? Kind of operationalize is actually the word I was looking for. Mm-hmm. So, so build it into how we do business, right? And so the more you can get clear on, on um, what do, do you stand for as a business, and sometimes that can be straight up on the business value side and how you treat your customers or, and whatever, um, but sometimes that can be, hey, how, how do we make decisions about these larger issues? I mean, you won't have all the answers all the way, but I think if you can come up with at least a policy or a, again, this constitution that you believe in, um, people will self-select, right? You know, not every business operates the same. And if people don't buy into how you operate, then they'll go to another business or vice versa. But then at some point as the business grows, you'll have that culture. And that's what actually builds culture. It's starting from your values and then building those into your behaviors and then you you got to decide. And so hopefully 80% of decisions are, you know, hey, look, this is what we said we were going to do and we, we're going to stick to it. Um, but then there's probably 20% that are gray area and, and also, you know, some subset of that that make you question your values, right? Like you, you sometimes have to ask yourselves, okay, well, you know, now in a new world with this new technology, with this new capability, does what we were saying before actually still apply? And, and what was the spirit of it, you know, now that we have these new circumstances? And, and I think that that's, ironically, very, very applicable to many things in our lives today. You know, you just made me realize, and it's great, Dion. I guess in the back of my mind, even as much as this is a very occasional hobby for me to think about AI, I kind of assumed that there was some big governing board somewhere that was making the ethical decisions. But what you made clear is, no, it comes down to your company, my company, Google making its own decisions. So if you think about autos, what happened to VW a few years ago where they were cheating about gas mileage and emissions and, you know, the CEO got fired and the whole deal. That was an ethical choice they made. Detroit has made other choices with their auto companies. Accounting firms go down. Investment banks go down. You're right. The the ethics are probably going to be made company by company, designer by designer, coder by coder. Yep. Really interesting. Are there, is there a leading voice on the ethics of AI or a resource or a book or a podcast that you would recommend? I honestly do not know of anybody and we'll take listener suggestions. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. I would love um, resources from, from the audience here, but I think there are a few, ironically, companies who are, you know, at the forefront of this, for better or for worse, right? So OpenAI, DeepMind, um, and, and a few others, their goal is to build things that are reasonably ethical, right? Um, I'm pretty sure, you know, OpenAI just kind of plastered that. Um, they're of the, I, I would assume, the Elon Musk school of thought, since he was one of the co-founders, that, hey, AI is going to be dangerous. Let's do what we can to make it safe, right? And so um, th- I would follow them, again, whether or not you, you know, agree with the leadership or whatever like th- these are these are definitely resources um, for folks who are who are looking into this stuff I, I do think though over time 
and, and where governments and institutions come into play is like some things will be quote unquote regulated, right? Crypto is being regulated and and oftentimes things are over-regulated, um, but in many cases they are regulated because there is a potential danger or something where having a central source of of governance would be helpful. And again, whether you think that's good or bad is, is kind of a, a different discussion. But um, so I do think over time, these kind of central governing bodies may pop up and it, it'll often be by consensus or like the, you know, the IEEE who, who makes standards on, on a whole bunch of engineering stuff might end yeah. up doing this. So we'll, we'll see. No, oh, that's good to know. Well, we're coming up on time. Anything else you want to share with the audience, Dion? Uh, no, I'm super excited. Thanks so much for having me. Um, you can find me on social media, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on uh, Instagram. I'm at Doji Dion, D-O-J-I-D-E-O-N. Um, the story behind that is, is for another day. Um, or just Dion Nicholas on, on LinkedIn. But I'm um, very excited to, to be here. Thanks for, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. I, uh, I've enjoyed this a lot. Thanks, Dion. Likewise, Carrie. All right. Talk to you soon. Thanks so much for watching the Kerry Newhoff Leadership Podcast on YouTube. If you haven't subscribed yet, do so. Share it with a friend and leave us a comment. And I've got two things I want you to do before you sign off today. Number one, if you're a church leader, I'd love for you to go out and visit hegetsuspartners.com slash Kerry. Click on the link because here's what's happening. There's a $100 million campaign going on, basically sharing the gospel with the world. And if you become a partner for the He Gets Us campaign, here's what happens. People who are interested and respond to the ad get connected to your church. It's an opportunity for you to enter into dialogue, have a conversation with them, people who are really authentically exploring Christianity. So go to hegetsuspartners.com slash carry. And also, if you haven't yet checked out the Art of Leadership Academy, make sure you do so. The Art of Leadership Academy has over 150 high quality, done for you resources for you and your team. Whether you're leading a church or whether you're leading a small business, you're an entrepreneur, it's done for you. I will train you in communication. I'll train you in team leadership. I'll train you in so many different things. We have PDFs, videos, downloads, cheat sheets, you name it, we've got it. It's ready to go. But it's beyond that. The Academy is also a community. I do live monthly coaching calls. We have an incredible community involved in daily dialogue. It is troll free and um, it's available for a very low membership fee every single year. Would love for you to check it out. Make sure you check out theartofleadershipacademy.com. Click the link and we'll see you inside there because here's why I started it. I graduated law school. Nobody taught me how to run a law firm. I graduated seminary and nobody showed me how to run a church. Had to figure it all out. So that's why we created the Art of Leadership Academy. It'll help you lead and help you thrive as you do it. Thanks so much for watching the podcast. We'll catch you next time. And I hope our time together today has helped you thrive in life and leadership.